The presentation I'm going to give you is um, the latest state of the research on novelty. There are several papers. It uh, dates back to uh, the research I did in 2003, but it's been evolving all the time. It may still be a little bit complicated and, and not fully consistent, but I'll do my best to give you an idea of what it is. So, the main... Uh, concept here is novelty and I'll go explain it right away uh, but the way we create novelty is by bootstrapping anticipation so that's again new terms I'll have to explain so first of all the novelty research right the feedback the, the, the problem of novelty is a, a feedback problem so you, your learning is based on experience but novelty is like a fundamental so Whatever you can anticipate, whatever you can create from your current knowledge system, well, that's not novelty. Novelty is, uh, if, you, if you look at uh, history and you see forecasts and then uh, like 20 or 40 years later, you see all kind of things that no one could have anticipated. That's the novelty. So somehow you could actually see novelty as anti-experience, but that's kind of a very wrong way to put it but uh, I'm hoping that in the rest of this presentation you will start understanding what novelty is. Now if you see that learning is based on, on experience and novelty is not actually not directly in your experience then how do you learn novelty or maybe a better question do you actually learn novelty? Now one thing is certain if you look at the uh, um, many of the different literatures that's out there, you'll see that knowledge is both a resource as a barrier to the novelty. And uh, what I'm going to show you is that the feedback paradox we are working on is actually, um, the, the, the problem has been seen before, but just in a very different setting. So I'll go and explain it later on. So the research is a cybernetic research. Cybernetic um, means the the study of uh, control systems, so feedback things, and um, so it's basically uh, focused on that. Now, th that allows us to, uh, so cybernetics, it's actually systems and cybernetics. You can see the, the regulation or the control or the feedback on different levels. So uh, novelty itself is a quite abstract pro uh, concept. Um, it's the common divider between discovery, creativity, and innovation. And what you see is that novelty emerges. But if you look then on the concrete level, they, they, it emerges on very different, uh, by very different means. Like there is the observation of discoveries. So discoveries happen by a, a event that takes place and uh, someone noticed the phenomenon. That's discovery. Creativity is uh, an, uh, synthesizing something based on maybe other building blocks that you create but that exists but then you synthesize it to something so that it's it's a difference that makes a difference you you clearly see creativity in art where you where you see the different uh, uh, ways of expressing but creativity is of course seen in many other ways but that's basically what you see creativity creativity emerges by uh, synthesizing Innovation, on the other hand, is, is, is also all of the concept discovery, creativity and innovation are not very strictly defined. But what you see is that there can be many inventions, but therefore they are not yet innovations. So what you see with innovation is that it requires a cultivation. Basically, you can see that it requires a cultivation of things that get discovered or things that get created. And it's, it's that, that those two will be in a relation, which uh, I will explain right away. Um, but uh, in, in the next part, I will actually try to give you a little better idea of what this uh, cybernetic research on novelty is by looking at studies on self-organizations and studies in cognition. That one specific feedback paradox or, or, or the, um, the, the relation you see between the discovery and creativity, we, we consider it uh, being in a bootstrapping relation. So I'll explain the bootstrapping relation uh, later on. Basically what you see is that A creates B and B creates A. So it's like the chicken and egg problem, but instead of like looking at which came first, the chicken or the egg, you actually try to understand how different stages, different iterations led to the creation of, uh, of, of the bootstrap of the, the chick versus the egg. 
Now, anticipation, it's also a very important uh, concept we're going to need. Um, anticipation is basically uh, two different uh, feeds together. Like, if you have feedback, the problem can be that your feedback comes too late. Like, if I want to check if I can uh, have one more step before I fall from a cliff, I mean, the last step I fall so that the feedback is going to be too late. Now, there's another concept no known as feed uh, forward, which kind of anticipate what will happen, but then you need an internal model to do that. And basically, as the world changes around you all the time, your, your model is going to be uh, uh, not efficient. So the feed forward uh, is never, uh, it, it's, it's only efficient in a static state. Uh, the best thing to do is try to uh, use feedback to update your feed forward and that's what we will call anticipation. Uh, a third uh, uh, concept we need is embodiment and embodiment is quite complicated to, to understand. It's actually uh, seen in multiple um, domains. On the one hand it's uh, mostly known in the cognitive studies where you try to understand intelligence and where it has become clear that intelligence cannot be disconnected from the body that that uh, is the vehicle for it. So you get you get embodied cognition, and now we are talking about extended cognition. But I'll talk about that later on. But there is also the the same uh, notion of embodiment if you go uh, into uh, philosophical studies like uh, the philosophy of media or philosophy on science and technology. Also, there you see the same kind of embodiment. And um, the, the one thing that, that I discovered in 2004 is that basically there's uh, one model to em embody uh, novelty regulation. And there's a model for, neural, uh, for a neural level or there's a model for a scientific facts level. And, and I'll show them later on, but that's basically the, the, um, the combination that made us focus on the idea that Novelty as the common divider between discovery, creativity and innovation is one regulation system, which is our cybernetic research. Okay, so let's uh, get a little bit closer to the self-organization. Basically, what you see here is a dissipative system. Um, you start with uh, a fluid, which is the uh, fluid is known to have a random interactions. So those are f uh, molecules in the fluid. They are they can move freely. What happens is you, uh, this is um, an experiment called the Benar cells. So what happens here is that you will heat the bottom of the fluid and the, um, the random variation will start uh, showing local organization, self-organization. In the end it has a, a nice, it's, it's uh, nicely coordinated. So um, this is a non-coordinated uh, state. This is the coordinated state. I will use coordinated later on, so that's why I'm, I'm emphasizing our, on this. But it actually requires a medium to mediate this change down here. This is um, shows uh, another example of that. There, you see here some kind of a local alignment happening, and that in the end leads to three kind of alignments. So, so there's a self-organizing kind of alignment. What you see here is that one loop will force another loop to appear. Um, well, loops, we, we call them, so in this experiment, they are called convection cells. So, and um, in the end, you kind of see that it's not as um, perfect as you see in this uh, diagram B here, because you see some kind of strange things there, but it's kind of, so you, you, you see medium, you see mediation, you see alignment, you see coordination. We're gonna talk about those concepts later on, but I'll first want to, uh, show you uh, the the physical example of bootstrapping. So what what you see here is an, a diagram of uh, um, a, a sailing against the wind, which kind of looks paradoxical in the sense that you're trying to use a force in a certain direction. So the wind is coming from the right to the left, right, and um, what you're trying to do is move a vehicle by the force of the wind from the left to the right, which seems paradoxical, but everyone knows that, that it's doable. So what is actually happening here? This is a very interesting uh, case to understand bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is A creates B and B creates A. Well, here you see the A and the B. Basically, 
uh, you go to one direction and then you go to the other direction and although you you've never been able to really go against the wind if you uh, look at the difference between a and b you get in a state c that is actually um, at the same um, l let's say orientation as you had uh, with a but you had to kind of zigzag your way around it so how does this actually happen? I mean, it's very important to understand a little bit of the details of this physical interaction to really understand what bootstrapping is about and what novelty is about. Basically, what happens is that the wind, so what you see here, is that the sail is almost um, in, in such a position to have minimal drag. So drag means that you, you have a, uh, is that the wind here pushes you uh, in 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 the from from right to left okay so it pushes from 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 here to there but you see that the wind is almost like aligned with it and that's basically to create create what is called a lift so what happens is that uh, on uh, there there will be wind coming on, on one side of the sail and wind on the other side of the sail but because the sail is ball you see that um, the, the, this wind will go faster than this wind. This has to take a uh, longer uh, uh, way. And so it, it's actually the, the, the method used in, um, like in aviation to lift an air ring up. So that's a, we call that force a lift. And so what, what eventually happens, so I'm not going to, um, if you want to know more about those physics, you can look them up. But what eventually happens is a, a force that's almost, almost, 90 degrees against the wind. But it's not inside the wind, so it's not yet, it's not yet A. So how do you get to A? It's a a is a combined force by the, the lift you find on the sails and uh, a reaction force on, on, the, on the boat itself, because the, the orientation of the boat is also important. It creates a reaction force. So this is, of course, the boat is not just in, in, in the air, it's in water. And there is a keel there, and the keel uh, is in the sideway of, of the boat, and that allows the boat to, to go easily uh, uh, back and forth, but it's hard for the boat to go uh, sideways. So you create more friction to go sideways. So what happens is that this lift on the sail uh, will actually uh, create viscosity force in the water that will react and create this kind of force. So what eventually happens is a combination force, which is smaller than your lift force, but it's inside the direction you need to go. See? So that's a little bit the trade-off you give. So there's a whole mechanism behind here that allows you to actually create a force that, that is in the right direction. And that's kind of more or less what we need. And that's kind of more or less what we also will see with novelty. So novelty, I mean, this could be, the wind will be like experience. Uh, for, for novelty, for learning and knowledge, it will be experience and it's experience force you in certain direction and there will be all these kind of mechanisms um, because you can, you can anticipate based on that experience but it doesn't yet con uh, contain novelty. The novelty is because you're, you're becoming pragmatic and you have to do these things in a certain uh, restriction and because of those certain pra pragmatic restrictions you, you can do actually less than what you, you can imagine, but what you can do will actually contain novelty. And then once, once you go in direction A and then back to B, so uh, you actually will go into the right direction. So that's basically, I'll show you that in, in later on, but what I'm trying to show here is that bootstrapping is actually also possible in a physical way we, we like think about sailing against the wind it seems paradoxical we can do it well the same is going to be the happening for novelty so what i'm trying to show over here also is how the the the, the, the wind and the, the the sails and the position of the boat and the water you you are uh, sailing in regulates and that's an important element here regulates what you can do so we had mediating here because you, and alignment and regulation and coordination and all those terms will come back and are uh, central uh, to our novelty model. But before we do that, we, we like to focus uh, on uh, cognition a little bit more. And I'm going to emphasize the relevance of the sensor motoric uh, operation that's our 
cognition is really uh, is doing so what you see on top here like the a b and c and also this this uh, all those dots here those uh, are experiments examples from gestalt so the first is um, so what you see in the first one is you kind of see a white triangle right but it's not actually there so the, the, you can sometimes see a line over here but there, there there's no, no difference there these are just three um, circles with with uh, with a uh, with a gap in, and our brain kind of makes us think that there is a triangle. Uh, over here, you see the same figure but in very different uh, positions. But I mean, if you just analyze the lines, it's it's how do we make that the same thing? So that's that. Th this is called invariance. Um, over here, you got an example of multistability. You can see a vase, or you can see two faces. And this one is called um, uh, aggregation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, if you look very carefully, you see here the head of a dog. It's a, I hope I pronounce it well, but it's a dull measure. And so this is the, the, the dog here. With, this is one leg and another leg here. And if once you see the dog, it's, you, you see the whole image better. I mean, there's a tree over here and he's sniffing somewhere below at the tree. But so... Uh, if you see this image for the first time, it's just dots. But when you start trying to see the shapes, you, you, your brain will actually make the uh, dog quite similar as a triangle over there. So what you kind of see here is that what you perceive and what you make of it may actually be two quite different things. Sometimes you force your, your, your models onto the reality, and that's quite important. Um, this is uh, called, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Venter... Well, okay, I forgot the name of it, but it's Venterbur Vehicle or something. It's a very uh, uh, classical example in cybernetics. So there's a very simple relation here. There's a wheel and there's a light sensor. And when the light sensor gets more light, it will for um, give more juice, more energy to the wheel. And if you connect them straight ahead, you will see that the the small robot you create seems to be um, afraid of light and, and, and goes away when, when you put on a lamp in somewhere in the neighborhood. Well, in the other end, if you cross-link them, uh, you will see that the, this vehicle kind of starts circling to right, to, towards the light. It seems very natural. It looks almost intelligent, but there, there's no intelligence here. So it's very interesting to see how something very simple as sensomotoric relation uh, creates uh, quite dynamic and complex behavior. And maybe uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit wrong with saying that there's no intelligence here. Maybe we need to rethink what intelligence really means. Um, so, so you see this sensomotoric coupling. Your perception is not fully your perception. Um, simple uh, perceptual relations create quite um, intelligence behavior. Over here, this is an example of stigmergy. I'm not going to go too deep in that concept here, but what you see is that the, the, the termite considers a heap of dirt and it uses it as a sign to... Uh, to, to um, to regulate its actions on. So what it will do, it will always drop uh, a, a, a piece of dirt on top of another piece of dirt. And this is how termites kind of build those big uh, um, termite hills. So, so you, you also, stigmergy is a very important concept. It, it basically is stigma, so it's a sign that makes you do uh, action. So it's, 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 it fits this uh, sensomotorical uh, Re in understanding we have. So now let's go a little bit more to uh, other things of cognition. So um, th th there are kind of, I mean, one thing is kind of certain that we don't fully understand cognition. We should we should should accept that. Um, but if you look at like the the experiments they did, we can actually get a bit better idea of what our brain is really doing. Like the top here, it's an example of change blindness. Uh, they they show this. A picture then they show a white screen and then they show this picture and then they ask people like what changed what you see is that over here two of those lines have been in the in a different direction and depending on how well you camouflage your your change uh, it takes quite a while for people to know it or they simply don't see it this is an example um, this is a very simple robot with just some counterweights and some um, it, it looks like a skeleton, 
but it can actually, if you give it a small push, it starts moving. And what you see when it moves is that it has a very natural kind of movement. So what we can understand from, from this thing is that, first of all, it takes very little energy to, to create the movement, but also that, um, that, that our movement is quite defined by the, um, the structure we, we have to, to allow us to move. So, so it's, it's kind of there, there are many strange things here. And what is really strange is what is known as brain plasticity. So I'm going to give you two examples of that. First of all, here. This is a, a blind person, a person that has become blind because it's, it, it, it cannot work for people who are born blind. There are some other issues with it. But what you see is that this is a, this is a camera and the camera catches an image that it will process the image and then it will eventually uh, project the image on uh, a sensory. Uh, um, so um, it looks like a lollipop and you have it in your mouth but it makes blind people see with their mouth. And in the experiments, you see that after 15 minutes uh, uh, using this tool, blind people are capable of catching a ball. So they did all kind of experiments. This is now already in uh, a, a later development stage. So uh, I hope uh, this, this will help blind people very soon in, in their daily activities. This is another Therapy. So what is very interesting here, what I also said before, is that um, you, you need that pragmatic uh, reality. I mean, who would think that you can create a lolly to see? I mean, that's, that seems so improbable. So what you see that your pragmatic uh, problem forces you to actually think outside of the box. And that's very important. And talking about a box, over here you see um, this is a... a a very it, 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 it's almost so trivial that that you kind of wonder why we didn't um, uh, coincidentally find the solution basically what you see here is just a mirror so it's called mirror box and it's used by people who suffer phantom limb pain so this person uh, lost his what is it its left arm and has pain in the left arm and what 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 you do as a therapy then is you you put your hand over here so that the patient kind of sees uh, the image of the, the the other hand and then it's asked to do exercises with both hands and then the pain the, the physical the the so the the the, uh, the phantom limb pain kind of resolves so it it it's kind of very strange because this is almost like the anti placebo effect right the the thing is you really the patient clearly knows that this is not the hand he, he has but by seeing the hand, so by the perceptual recognition and by feeling that he, he is doing the exercise, he actually uh, resolves pain. So this should tell, tell us a lot about uh, what, what our brain is about. One of the things I think is very important here is alignment. You see, you, you, you may not need an eye to look, you may see with your tongue, but probably the eye is the best interface to do so right over here it's also the alignment because the 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 hand is not there anymore but you need to um uh, uh, you need to feedback from a perceptual level to to make your brain understand that um you had enough exercise so so there are some very interesting uh, concepts over there now um if we if we take all that stuff it means all very interesting and clear but what can we do with it well um, one thing we, we add before we actually try to do anything with it uh, is that we will also look at uh, evolutionary studies and try to understand how evolution deals with novelty because they are capable of dealing with novelty. I mean, the creatures have learned to fly. How did they do that? I mean, no one was there to, to tell them how to do that. So what you see here is if you look at the embryological development of an animal, that at certain stages that em embryo almost looks the same. So in a certain way, it seems as we are reliving uh, evolution uh, when, we, when we fabricate anything. And what I'm really wondering is if, if this is true for a biochemical level, right? If this is true for your for fertis, why should that be different for any other thing we do? So what I'm kind of start creating is is a, a an, an kind trying to understand this uh, sensorotorical perception and try to give 
a model that may actually explain a little bit of uh, behind it. So what you see uh, on the right is a face, right? And this image is the um, the 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 uh, the measurement of the what is called cascading eyes. So you, your eyes make very rapid movements. And this is kind of a capturing of what your eye does when it looks at this picture. So they did it with kind of all kind of uh, test subjects and, and they kind of figured out that it's almost the same structure. You see, spend a lot of time looking at the eyes. Why? Because the eyes tell you a lot more than, than what you would think. So what I'm trying to do here is actually use very simple anticipation uh, mechanisms in a bootstrapping relation to uh, to get from from um, simple pattern matching to something as complicated as um, observing a, a face. So this is just um, a, a, a test. So what you have is an internal process and an external process and each of them make simple pattern matchings uh, but because they interact, uh, they will do uh, be able to coordinate to a more complicated system. So what I what I expect is that at the very first milliseconds, you see uh, you see you see shades, right? With uh, there are other experiments showing that if you move something too fast, that people see shades. So what we actually expect is that in a few milliseconds, your your eye will quickly try to create the boundaries, check the boundaries, focus on them. And then it may actually get to a shape. So, but if this is like the external checking, the external feedback happening, then you kind of uh, stop with the with the shape itself. So here you see like uh, an oval shape that would would be like a little bit to to here. So so you see that in the first probably the the outer boundary is like this first check, let's say. So, but this is the external. So external anticipates to tags let's say to to stigmas well what is internally happening is uh, think about the game uh, if if i say a word what's the first thing that pops in your mind so if i say round you may think about um ball apple or face but what you see is that each of the three have external features so if you have a conceptual model of these different asso associated elements you can actually check if it's a ball, so it's not, no, it's not an apple either, so it's a face. So by combination of two quite simple um, algorithms, you can actually create quite complicated things. There's only one catch here, and it's you actually need the, the knowledge. But that's what we're going to try to solve with the bootstrap. So, um, I said that there were uh, different domains um, talking about uh, embodiment of um, of uh, novelty regulation and um, we actually discovered that there are two models that are almost identical and they don't seem very identical if you look at from from uh, just next to each other but at the, as we finished with our own uh, basic research on uh, novelty which was basically simulations so agent simulations trying to create a creative act you kind of, with that model extra, you see the similarities between them. And I'll just going to explain them here. So this is the idea of um, different parts in your brain connected to a global workspace. And in so in the end, you see that there are four elements connected. And then you have this workspace. So what you see, this workspace, it's like a blackboard, right? It's, it's a medium where you put these uh, new elements to. And... Uh, for the brain, you also have uh, the the motor few, um, the motor system. Now um, we expect this is actually a special case because uh, the concepts actually need to lead to action, right? Think about the stigmagy. So you need to kind of this this fifth output to actually do stuff. Now this is actually a different model uh, related to how science interacts uh, with the world. Uh, so this is on a social level, and what we see is that. Uh, I'm going to explain that later, but basically those four loops can map with those four loops. And this fifth loop, links and knots, that's basically your workspace again. So again, that's not really a loop, that's a medium. And um, so what we, if we, if we kind of analyze it in a lot more of detail, and you think about this, the, the f first parts I did in the presentation, you kind of get to this model that shows you how 
four anticipation processes, this so internalizing, directing, externalizing, and learning, are four anticipation processes that stand in a very interesting uh, relation, they will actually bootstrap novelty. And how do they do that? Basically, um, we have uh, a self-knowledge. Uh, in the cases we saw so far, you can see that as your long-term memory. And um, so you, you use that to, to mediate and create an internal model um, for a specific moment. Like, you, I mean, if you just think at, uh, at your uh, knowledge, you have more knowledge than you need at every moment in time. So what you kind of do is, from all the knowledge you have, try to put what you need at this moment into a workspace. So that's what the mediation is doing. On the other hand, you have an environment right and uh, the environment like i showed you with the uh, sailing against the wind but also with all the other examples it kind of regulates your possibilities i mean you may want to jump over uh, a water but if it's um one i don't know if it's too big it's you are not capable to so so it restricts it it controls it's uh, it limits whatever you can do so but at every moment everything in in an environment is way too complicated so what you again do is you anticipate what you actually need from the external and I'm gonna give a very simple example but if you are in a restaurant many of the people you won't notice that there are numbers on a table uh, mostly there are some numbers on a table but we are blind to them because they are not relevant to what we need we, we search for the menu card we, we try to find a good location we are looking at the other people in the restaurant but for the, the, the people who are serving in a restaurant those numbers are very important so, so they see that on a different level it's just a simple example uh, to show that if you are in a certain environment people can perceive it in different ways so that's what the externalizing tries to anticipate. What is it that I'm seeing? Think about the Gestalt examples. You don't just see things. You, you see what you project on your environment. It's a big difference. So you push that on the workspace. And then you got that alignment happening. Because maybe uh, you have a certain motivation to, to like uh, do stuff. But uh, that can change. And if that change, then whatever you are pushing whatever you are internalizing and whatever you are externalizing will become different so that's why you need a kind of alignment here so that's uh, that will give you direction and then by all those activities you actually create a kind of experience and that experience will lead to um, coordination because it will allow you to start modeling the things or fabricating things in the environment and then you get this outer loop because once you start understanding patterns from the activities you are doing and you've pushed it in your model that actually becomes now a possibility to use in in for your internalizing so what you will see here is that this is the basic um, architecture of the novelty model the four anticipation processes uh, will always stay the same and the three um, medias you need like so you've got the self-knowledge the workspace and the environment those are three medias they also will be the same what will change all the time are uh, the things uh, that control uh, the anticipation because every anticipation process needs an internal model so it needs a kind of control element so the mediation alignment regulation and coordination will change and those are the four control elements but because of those four uh, change the interpretation of modeling and fabrication will change also and I'm going to show that uh, in in some concrete examples like I just switched the slide I hope you you noticed it so but basically in knowledge creation you see that uh, so think about this example right internalizing externalizing uh, so here you create associations here you create additions because this face you add it to your to your workspace so so this is what you get over here. You get associations and you get additions. And for knowledge, mostly um, what directs you are challenges. Uh, do you want to do A or do you want to do B? What does it actually mean? All those kind of things are challenges and that will change, create direction. So um, together, uh, they will actually create experience, which is the source for the learning. And then you can do two things. Or you can try to master something like painting or driving a car or whatever 
Um, and that actually changes the way you act into the environment or you can try to understand the thing on itself like what you do in class mostly and then you try to articulate your self-knowledge you try to articulate yourself basically so that's for knowledge creation but the interesting thing is that it's just not uh, only for knowledge creation but let me first go a little bit more into detail about this uh, articulating here and mastering here because it really maps well with other work on knowledge creation this is Nonaka's Seki model and what you see here is that um, you kind of have always a, a, a switch and a transfer so here you see uh, the first thing that it starts with is socialization it's like think about a, a master apprentice relation so you try to see what the other person is doing and learn from that so what you can do is transfer tacit knowledge from one person to another person so that's that's um, one example of transferring. Um, this, uh, the next phase here is externalization. Uh, so don't, don't uh, uh, mix it with internalizing and externalizing. Uh, Nonaka called it externalization and internalization. It's a little bit uh, confusing, but they are not exactly the same with uh, the use in the novelty model. But here the externalization, what you see is that many individuals create a group. And what you have in the group is that you basically need to speak the same language because you, you don't like over here, the, the dotted line, they overlap, right? While here, they can't overlap all of them. So you need to give, create a jargon or sometimes like in business, they use um, quite um, disconnected metaphors to, to keep a group together. Um, so, but basically they will create their local knowledge. So if you look at science and technology studies, they talk about local knowledge. Think about Heidegger and other um, philosophers. Um, uh, Rouse, for example. Um, so, so what you have is this local knowledge is only uh, understandable for a certain group. So what you see here, however, is that you shift it from tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge. That's... So this was a transfer, this is a shift. Now we see another transfer. Now we see from explicit to explicit. What happens is that the different groups uh, in an organization uh, should collaborate. And then you see that your local knowledge need to be become a, a standard. So your knowledge become a lot more uh, independent of, of the local entity. So. So what you what you actually get here is that you're you're making your knowledge even more explicit, uh, and you can actually use it to transfer things. Like um, an example is that if you created uh, a good uh, abstract uh, statistic definition, you can actually start using that outside the domain of mathematics, right? So sometimes you create something and it becomes more than so it can be uh, it can be used in different contexts. So that's what you see over here also, like the groups starting to interact. Now the last thing here, it's uh, an individual is inside a group, is inside an organization, but by all these activities, uh, the individual gets new knowledge. And with the new knowledge, uh, he, can, he or she can act. And by acting, you create uh, tacit knowledge again. So that's how this spiral, this constructive knowledge creation is working. Basically, if I look at it, my model, I only have this articulating and mastering. But if I look at Nonaka's model, uh, you can actually see that this is the shift. And then it's uh, the transfer of the shift. So, so you should see uh, internalizing and socializing as basically, so you go from explicit knowledge to tacit knowledge. This is from explicit to tacit. This is the mastering part, right? While over here, you go from tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge. That's the articulation part. So, so you can map that uh, to the uh, novelty model. So um, I earlier on mentioned that there were two models, right? I'll go back to that slide. So over here, this is a, a, a brain... Um, interface basically that study on the brains and this is a science uh, uh, interface now I've talked a lot about concept and cognition and perception so I guess this one is quite understandable and with this uh, model of uh, Nonaka you kind of start understanding what knowledge creation is about but let's have a closer look to the scientific facts because it's a very interesting case of the also of the novelty model but in this case it creates agency 
So in our prior, prior case, you create knowledge, right? Your knowledge creation here. But now we are actually creating agency. So what you see is that um, the, um, in, in, in mean, I'm going to present it in another situation, but for example, if you can actually create at a certain moment an instrument, that would be your new knowledge entity because it, it links you to the reality, but it may be um, not well enough defined yet. And you need all these other actors to create an ecosystem where your new knowledge, your novelty can actually uh, become autonomous. And that's over here. Uh, Latour called it autonomization, which I don't think is an English word, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, this is what's happening. Now, the, the problem in this model is that if you look at my novelty model, you see one, two, three, four loops, and then you have one, two, three uh, medias, uh, which allows you to clearly see uh, all the regulation and feedback. Now, of course, um, Latour is not a cybernetic person, so but what he actually did is uh, the links and knots are the three different workspaces. And therefore, you see that the learning is actually a little bit mixed with the, the, the different regulation elements. So what you see over here is allies, colleagues, and instruments, which I will abstract to artifacts. Those are already three of your uh, regulation systems. The public representation, you can actually see audiences making up the public. So I will use audience as the, as the other agent. And then we have one, two, three, four agents here. And they, though, those will be the uh, model. So I'll project it back to my novelty model. So we have the allies, we have the um, um, artifacts, which is the abstraction of the instruments, and we have peers instead of colleagues. Now, um, I, I transformed it to peers because if I look at the management literature, they're talking often about competitors, and they seem to be the same. Uh, I kind of present that in another presentation there. The, the peers um, become different depending on the stage in the innovation, but that's for another presentation. Um, so what you kind of see is that uh, now agents regulate the novelty model and what, what then will come out of it is of course an agent. So th that's kind of the relation you, you always have, have. So you can use the novelty model to make things emerge related to the types you are actually using as regulate uh, as control elements so if you use four agents you will get agency if you use four concepts you will get knowledge so what is this automatization and what is this mobilization let me go into that well let me just try to uh, explain you how these uh, different elements relate first of all internalizing the artifact internalized just think about uh, the concrete example over here is the instrument if you can measure like uh, the difference in in speed in light speed of light you actually use it uh, to to mediate your your theories to build your your models to create all kind of things with it and so on um but that's that's very interesting for the scientists which are the peers with our who are actually learning and you need diff you need more than one scientists because otherwise uh, the knowledge can of course um, um, get lost but if you have more uh, people together they can actually uh, have uh, uh, well, well, we talk about peer evaluation right so so you need them to learn and um, so that's internalizing an artifacts what, what you see then is that mostly if the research kind of starts becoming more robust you have these allies that start using your your uh, science to inside society. So that's why you need allies. Allies will actually reinforce the science by making it useful. And that's a very important uh, step. But, I mean, allies also kind of very much depend on how the public thinks about it. Uh, I mean, if you think about cloning or you think about the internet, uh, one innovation gets resistance, the other gets uh, positive feedback. So, so you see that the audience really defines what you can do. Uh, what are the, the constraints of, of, of what you want to do? Of course, you can have that. Allies can, for example, uh, create resources to make the artifact, but they could, for example, also create resources to facilitate the audience. There are all kinds of possibilities here. There are many, many different uh, cases, and they all kind of seem to fit this more general or abstract model here uh, related to 
uh, the novelty model. So um, basically, those are like two examples I wanted to show you uh, re related to the novelty model. Of course, the next thing to do is validate this model a little bit, and therefore we we need to extend uh, the, the theory to uh, a useful product. But that's what we're going to do in a different video.